Hello, everyone. Welcome to Pi Data Global. This is building a successful data science team. My name is Justin Nguyen, and if you've seen any of my previous talks or other conference presentations, I usually talk about NLP pipelines and custom feature extraction and unsupervised topic modeling. Today, I'm going to go in a different direction. First, I'm going to talk about cooking. Yes, I know what you're thinking, and you are correct. The fish on the left did turn into the fish tacos on the right. The second thing I'm going to talk about is my more recent work, which is helping organizations build or rebuild their data science teams. And you might be wondering, whoa, 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 cooking, building a data science team, they seem like they're very, very different, but they're not. You see, cooking and building a data science team have a lot in common. First, there's a lot of people trying to do it, but do they really understand what and why they're doing it? Do they understand each component, each ingredient, the flavor, the texture, the aroma, as well as how everything comes together and connects into a cohesive harmony? The second, like any great dish, is that you rarely get it right on your first try. The same goes for building a great data science team. If you are nailing it on your first try, then you should consider yourself one of the very, very few and one of the very, very lucky. And finally, a great dish has a lot of steps. It has a lot of ingredients. And you don't pop it in the microwave for 90 minutes. It takes time. The same goes for building a great data science team. They require a lot of pieces to be in place uh, within the data science team and beyond the data science team. They require <clears throat> more than just a smart data scientist or two, and they aren't built overnight. Now, it may seem like I'm making successful data science sound really, really difficult. Well, that's because it is. Over eight out of 10 data science projects never make it to production. Most of the data science projects that you do, most of the data science teams that you build are not destined to succeed. The odds are stacked against us. And why is this? Why are so few data science teams successful? Based on the teams that I've studied, the teams that I've worked with, I'm gonna share three things that are really distinguish the successful versus the not so successful data science teams. Those three things are building the right team, picking the right use cases, in rapid technical enablement. So let's get started with building the right team. Before we talk about the people, let's first establish what we are trying to do. If we wanna define the positions and draft the players, let's first align on what we're trying to achieve. And successful data science, as we have all learned by now, goes beyond just the hyperparameter tuning. It goes beyond the iterative development cycles and sprints beyond Chris DM. Successful data science requires success beyond data science. <clears throat> it requires you to find a feasible and value opportunity that hasn't been fulfilled. It requires due diligence and validating some insight. It requires lots of accurate and accessible data and so forth. It requires a lot of components and these are really difficult challenges that you have to get right. You have to be successful at every one of these toll gates or else your project will not be successful. You can't ignore or fail any one of these steps and still have success at the end. Fortunately, for most of us, I think, uh, we've realized that data science teams are more than just data scientists, which brings us to a more holistic approach that, uh, that have examined where we have now, thankfully, much more of a balance. Rather than ask your data scientists to do everything under the sun, now, <clears throat> um, unlike before, we're allowing them to focus on what they're good at by adding other people and adding other skill sets. And this is a good thing. It's a good step in the right direction. We're adding subject matter expertise and experience, 
We're adding executive engagement and we're adding communication because going back and mapping these to the process, this is what we need to be successful. This divide and conquer is much better, much more efficient, much more successful than having one person or one type of person like your data scientists trying to accomplish all of this Mm. on their own. Now, you might be looking at this template and think, this is great. (laughs) Uh, I wish we could fill out my data science team like this with uh, these kinds of resources and all this expertise. And you're right. I mean, this this has worked well for me in the past. And ultimately, it's a recipe that works. But just like any recipe, you can follow it and still get it wrong. How does that happen? Well, it happens when you don't understand the recipe. You need to understand what every step does, what every component is supposed to do in order for everything to come together at the end. So let me first start with these three roles. These are all great roles and great people to have on your team. Based on their responsibilities within the company, they have access to a lot of very, very valuable and crucial resources. Um, They have access to experience and data and other expertise that you will need. But that's still not enough. The really successful data science teams that I've seen have people who do more than just serve in these roles. They deliver resources, but they also deliver results. And how do they do that? Well, they assume their role. They own their role but they also leverage some exceptional quality that they have. And this quality isn't a job title. It's some intrinsic and natural talent that they're known for. We all know someone or have someone in our organization who is an exceptional storyteller, innovator, or leader. They're very, very hard to find and probably a pain in the butt to get your hands on. And so these people probably aren't sitting around and waiting for you to ask them to join their data science team, right? But if and when you can combine these qualities on the right with the resources on the left, that is what makes this recipe work. Because going back to this data science process, just imagine you position your top innovators and leaders and storytellers and drop them into key steps where you need them, where you must be successful. Well, that's how you leverage your ingredients. This is how and why this recipe works. So uh, let's talk about the other two roles here, uh, data scientists and data engineers. And I'm sorry, I'm going to be honest with you guys. I don't have any shortcuts or secrets to getting around the recruiting and hiring headache, except for this. When you're getting recruited every week by at least three new companies every week, you start catching on and figuring out how to tell and distinguish between them. It's very apparent which ones are mature organizations that will allow you to uh, do data science and engineering versus which ones where you'll be a one-man band and just pass the torch to yourself. It's very obvious where you'll be successful. And if it's not obvious, then that's probably because you're a recruiter, not a data scientist. Now, my advice is to set up your data science team in a way that attracts great talent. Great data scientists want to be great at data science. Great data engineers want to be great at data engineering. Both want to be successful. So this process, this support system, this collection of diverse resources and skills allows them to do that. If I'm a hotshot data scientist or engineer and you ask me to join a team with other great data scientists and engineers and innovators and great leaders and storytellers, well, that's joining a recipe for success. So... Let's move on to the second topic for today. Um, and uh, and I want to talk about cooking for a date. And I mean a date date, not your spouse or kids, but someone you're really trying to impress. 
So what starts going through your mind? Well, the first thing you'll probably ask yourself is, what can I cook well? Uh, if you're like me, this is a very easy question to answer because this list is very short. The second thing you ask is, what will impress? And if you're like me, again, uh, this list will be very short. Now, remember, this is a date date. So first impressions go a long way. So you need an early win, and you want to make it a double win. You want to impress. The other thing, so cooking for a date is just one of those things where there's a lot that can go wrong, right? It's one of those things in life where you have a very, very limited number of paths to success and a seemingly limitless number of paths to failure. So for example, maybe you decide that I have nothing in my arsenal that will impress, so I need to try something completely new something that you've never made before. Well, this is really risky. And I don't know who needs to hear this, but your odds of success are not that good. Another thing that can happen is that you aim for perfection. So uh, you start, for example, to overthink or overdo what you're making. And as a result, you make things worse. <clears throat> and then last is insufficient planning. So um, you forgot to check the pantry for ingredients. You forgot to plan dessert. Uh, you forgot she had a shellfish allergy. The list goes on. You get the point. The point is that there's a lot to think about and there's a lot that can go wrong. Picking a data science use case is like cooking for a date. <laughs> First, you ask yourself, what can I cook well or what is highly feasible? Um, what data, technology, expertise, resources do I have? And then you also ask what will impress or what is most valuable? Which use cases will deliver the most value? Also, same rule applies. First impressions go a long way. So your early wins need to be double wins. And then the same pitfalls apply. You can try something completely new and outside of your wheelhouse. You can build R2-D2 or an Iron Man suit, but that's pretty risky. Um, another pitfall is aiming for perfection, right? And data science, data science is about pro progression, not perfection. So aiming for the perfect machine learning model is a really great way to bankrupt yourself and waste a lot of time. And then finally, insufficient planning. And this is the most common pitfall that I see. Um, the success of your use cases will be determined by your planning. Planning your use cases is where companies often trip and they don't get their value out of data science. <clears throat> so how do you plan? Well, for starters, go back to those questions. Determine first what is highly feasible. I often call this uh, the art of the possible. And this means gathering leaders from across the organization and brainstorming all of the possibilities, um, all of the pain points, all of the nice to haves. And it sounds tedious, but um, it's really not. It gives people an opportunity to be heard and to share their ideas on how to improve the business. And usually these discussions are a lot of fun. Once you determine the art of the possible, now you want to prioritize them into the art of the valuable. You want to rank these based on the measurable value that they return. Now, again, your, use, your early wins need to be double wins. So prioritize use cases that will impress your organizations or your customers. Now, <clears throat> um, let's say you go through all these, all these steps and now you have your use cases picked. I want to talk about a step that often gets skipped, even though it makes a huge difference. So a lot of data science projects start with this quote, and we've all heard it before. We have all this data, what can we do with it? So what do we do? Well, as data scientists, we go to work, right? We acquire the data, we start analyzing and developing, and then at the end, we try to derive or summon the value that we can get out of what we just did. But there's a couple of problems with this approach. So first, we often don't get a chance to finish our work. We're heads down, we're working, and maybe we get close to the end, but then we get pulled into something else. 
there's another problem that requires our skill set. The second thing that often happens is confusion. So stakeholders, they get confused, or maybe we get confused on what we're trying to achieve or deliver. And that's bad because confusion kills momentum. We talked earlier about evangelism and storytelling. Well, we can't get buy-in from outside of the data science team if there's confusion or zero energy. Point being, the likelihood of success for whatever this use case is, is very, very slim. A better approach is to spend more time planning up front. Now, you still need to do the other steps. You still need to acquire the data and analyze and develop and so forth. But before you do, you do two things. The first is you identify and study the actual problem or pain point that you're, tr that you're solving. And then the second is you establish your KPIs up front. By doing a little bit more planning here at the beginning, it resolves the two issues we saw earlier. So first, it protects you from the scope changing. Now we know what we're focusing on um, before anyone tries to import Pandas or SKLearn. And then second, it eliminates the confusion by setting very clear goals that we are marching towards. Goals that can be communicated and goals that everyone is aware of. This is a very, very simple step and it solves a lot of headache down the road. So after you do your due diligence and planning and you finally hit the ground running, it's time to start executing your use cases. <clears throat> By now, we all know that data science is very different than your traditional and slow moving IT. For example, traditional IT is uh, heavily focused on minimizing risk, whereas data science is very risky and focused heavily on rapid experimentation. Good data scientists will fail fast and deliver rapid and incremental wins. A lot of the do's versus don'ts on here go back to some of the themes we talked about earlier. Um, and to summarize, it's don't aim, for, for, don't aim for perfection, aim for progression, and make sure you're focused on delivering value. Build what will impress your business or customers. This brings us to the third and final topic for today, rapid technical enablement. So I'm gonna assume that by now, we've all realized that data science teams need loads of data and databases and compute and tools and so forth. So I'm not gonna talk about those. Instead, I'm gonna talk about going beyond that in other ways <clears throat> um, that you can empower your data science team. So, Another way of phrasing this is uh, the question I want to address is, how do I support my data science teams? And this is a very non-trivial question, right? I mean, everyone is trying to poach everyone. So how, uh, how do you be successful while also retaining and keeping your folks happy? So there's an author, speechwriter, and lawyer named Daniel Pink. He studied a bunch of successful technical teams, and he came up with this theory that I think works really well for data science teams. It's basically that high-achieving individuals are driven to pursue three things, mastery, autonomy, and purpose. <clears throat> so let me start with mastery. Good data scientists always want to grow. Data science is constantly evolving, and you need to evolve with it. Does your data science team have that access to grow and evolve? Are there a wide range of experts to learn from? Uh, do your data scientists get to attend webinars and conferences like PyData? Are they involved in user groups and so forth? <clears throat> or are they uh, the one-man band that we talked about earlier? Are they siloed? Um, are they always just constantly working and putting out fires without having the time to invest in themselves. The next is autonomy, and this is really about ownership. So one thing I like to tell people on my team is that you have 51% of the vote or decision, but 100% of the accountability, meaning that you ultimately decide on the strategy, the tactics, and the how, but you also own the outcome. It almost becomes personal. 
Um, and it's no secret that if you're completely responsible for the outcome, you're going to make sure the outcome is pretty dang good. And then the last is purpose. So we all want to do impactful work that makes a difference. Um, and we all know that we should establish and communicate this purpose. The thing that we forget is that we forget, especially when you're a data scientist or engineer. Um, it's just, it's very easy to lose track of what you're doing all of this for. And so don't forget to remind your teams and bring them back out of the shadows. So anyway, this is an overview of, um, of mastery, autonomy, and purpose. It's a good guide and barometer to gauge how you can support your data science teams. <clears throat> um, and really ask yourself, are you giving them all three of, uh, of these things? Because if you are, you're in a good spot. You're, you're better than most. Um, but if we go back to the question of supporting data science teams, especially kind of that data science specific component, there's two more things that, uh, that I've noticed and I want to call out. The first is creating the experience, which is something I see data science teams struggle with a lot. So we're going to go back to cooking for a second. If you're a practical person like me, you've probably wondered why pay so much for a restaurant. A $20 rack of lamb at a grocery store is at least $70 at a restaurant. And it's a rack of lamb, right? I mean, you look on the left and it's already just a great piece of meat. The only difference between the picture on the left and the picture on the right is 20 minutes on the grill. 20 minutes. As data science teams, we often produce this great model or great insight, but what's missing is that last 20 minutes. It's that narrative. It's that experience. It's that last 20 minutes on the grill, which is what people pay a lot of money for. And I don't mean diagrams or knowledge graph projections or topic modeling visualizations or IDEs or even word clouds or whatever charts, graphs, whatever. I mean this. Mark one, introduce yourself. Hello, I am a combination of mobile AI and Spark Technologies. I was built by Justin Wynn in early 2019. So far, my AI includes an LP, computer vision, and data analysis. I can be programmed and trained to do almost anything. Speaking from experience, <clears throat> this is what your business or customers will pay for. They may want or ask for data science or insights, but what they really want is the narrative and the experience. And for those of you who are familiar with mobile programming, this has very little to do with data science. All of this is, this is just the last 20 minutes on the grill. And this is something that every data science team needs. The last thing that every great data science team needs is a servant leader. So Vince Lombardi once said the importance of, he once emphasized the importance of blocking and tackling. I'm here to tell you that this applies in data science as well. Your data scientists and engineers are very, very talented. They're very, very skilled. And this means that they're going to be pulled in many different directions. <clears throat> and these are going to be directions that they may not want to be pulled in or shouldn't be pulled into. So if you want your data science team to deliver great data science, you need to block and tackle for them. So let's wrap this up. We talked about three things today, uh, building the right team, picking the right use cases, and technical um, enablement. So some closing thoughts. First, make sure you fill the right roles on your team and understand the parts they play. You need resources as well as skill sets. Don't just follow the recipe, but develop a deep understanding for it. Second is pick your use cases very wisely and make sure you plan, plan, plan. Just like cooking for a date, first impressions matter. So focus on delivering value quickly. And then last is give your data science teams mastery, autonomy, and purpose. That's a great start. But once you have that established, give them more. Lead them to deliver that full experience and narrative that your business or customers will pay a lot of money for. 
And then also make sure that you block and tackle for them along the way. I'd like to thank all of you for attending my talk today. <clears throat> if you're interested in learning more or if you want to discuss any of the, uh, the techniques or the dishes uh, that I spoke of today, please feel free to reach out. That's all I had for today. Until next time, enjoy the rest of the conference.